Okay, everybody, it looks like we are live, and I want to thank everybody for joining us today on Standing for Truth. On Standing for Truth, as you know, we focus on the truth of biblical creation. We also host debates and discussions, and I want to point out, if you had not yet seen the big debate last week between Joseph Hubbard and Snake Was Right on Young Earth Creation and Noah's Flood, it didn't happen, please check that out. It was definitely a lot of fun and one to remember. It's getting a lot of good feedback. So guys, please make sure to check that one out. And uh, I'm extremely excited to introduce tonight's very important topic. We will be discussing volcanoes and Noah's flood. Now, before we uh, introduce our guests for the, for the night, I want to go over a couple reminders because as everybody has probably seen, if you check the upcoming live stream section, we've got a ton of shows. We've got a ton of interviews, debates, discussions uh, scheduled already for the next for the next month or two. So uh, reminder, we've got next week on the 28th, we've got Refuting Human Evolution with Dr. Dan Biddle, who everybody would know from Genesis Apologetics, the Genesis Apologetics Ministry, as well as the following day. We've got Dr. Gordon Wilson, where we will be discussing abiogenesis and special creation. Put it this way, we are going to be demolishing abiogenesis. Uh, Dr. Gordon Wilson has written numerous articles for Answers in Genesis, which you guys can check out in the description box. Also, the very first week of May is packed with shows. Uh, we've got beautiful orchids of Jurassic Ark with John McKay, the creation guy. And uh, so just make sure you guys set those reminders. Like I said, we've got a lot of great shows planned for you. The last thing I'll point out as well is um, Matt and myself, we are going to be releasing the next episode in our Dinosaurs and Man, the Coexistence of Dinosaurs and Man series. That should be available on Patreon tonight after this stream. So anyways, enough for me. I am excited. Extremely excited to introduce our guests. We've got Professor David McQueen and George Bond. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Professor McQueen, you have been an incredible blessing to this ministry. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, what a blessing you've been and all the, the help you've given to us, David. Well, the feeling is mutual. Uh, George and I are like a couple of dancers in a Broadway play. The more that we do the dance, the better we get. And so uh, I'm, uh, I'm very thankful for George's uh, perceptive research. And uh, I would like for him to begin our time today with an overview about volcanoes. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, David. Um, well, my, my, my introduction will be quite brief, actually. <clears throat> I just wanted to introduce the audience to some basic stuff. Uh, um, firstly, what is a volcano? Well, generally, it's a volcano. Volcano is a rupture in the crust of a planetary mass object, not just Earth. There are volcanoes in other planets that have been observed. Um, the, these allow hot lava volcanic ash and gases to escape from the magma chamber below the surface. Now, you're going to be amazed at some of these statistics that I'll um, present um, uh, later on as well, but there are roughly about 1,500 potentially active volcanoes worldwide today. This is aside from the continuous belts of volcanoes on the ocean floor at spreading centres like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Now, about 500 of those 1,500 volcanoes have erupted in historical time. Uh, many of those are located, uh, as you've probably heard, along the uh, Pacific Rim known as the Ring of Fire. Now, you're going to be amazed at the next uh, statement here. There, there are a couple of professors that have estimated there could be up to 10 million submarine volcanoes. Now, I was amazed when I read that particular statistic, but I'll, I'll present some more information on some of those later. So I'll hand the mic back to David for his presentation. Thanks, SFT. 
Okay, thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I'm going to set my uh, timer for 20 minutes for uh, an intro. And then George and I will go back and forth. And then uh, we'll have some Q&A. As George correctly points out, volcanoes are very common in our modern world. They are common along the mid-ocean ridge, going all the way up to the country of Iceland. Iceland actually straddles the mid-ocean ridge, and so uh, it's a very important volcanic area. Uh, certainly the Pacific Rim, the rim of fire that he mentioned, uh, is important. As we go to the topic of volcanoes within creation science, you need to understand the amount of heat generated by the volcanoes. Now, if you look at my scarves and appearance today, I'm in Louisiana. It's supposed to be like 100 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, I guess that's 30-something uh, uh, C. But today it's only like four or five, plus four or five degrees C, unseasonably cold here in Louisiana, but not unseasonably cold in volcanoes. There is a range of temperatures uh, when you deal with lava. And as I teach uh, tonight, I'm not going to waste a lot of time talking about 1,200 degrees C or 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, because when you get to numbers like 1,000 or 2,000, it really doesn't matter which thermometer you're using. So uh, ordinary lavas are 1,200 degrees, and these are basaltic lavas I'm talking about here. And the Hawaii volcanoes that Ms. McQueen and I visited uh, in uh, 1985 uh, are the hottest erupting volcanoes at about 2,000 degrees C. Now, where do volcanic eruptions come in when we're talking about the whole issue of flood geology? Well, flood geology, as we've said before, extends solar system wide. And I can remember studying about the craters on the moon, like you see here, and the large crater there. There is a very long debate, actually going back hundreds of years, as to whether that's a volcanic eruption or a meteorite impact. Uh, I've come to the viewpoint that there, uh, the lava flows on the moon are produced by meteorite impacts, uh, not uh, a volcanic eruption, but it's a very old uh, argument and uh, one that is worth uh, discussing. Now, as we pointed out many times in our discussions, or we routinely point out, we view the Bible at Standing for Truth, and I personally and George also, as a historical document. And so if we're going to have a perspective about what happened in 6,000 years of geologic history on, on the earth, we have to use the Bible as our God. So if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, we see um, that God created the heavens and the earth. Then on the third day of creation, we see that God uh, brought the dry land up and there was uh, some material there, soil and rocks. But what kind? Again, a proverb that we've talked about for the last several weeks is that the Bible contains all we need to know to make an overall scientific hypothesis in geology or astronomy or biology but it does not contain everything we want to know. So using that proverb as a, as a basis, what can we say? Were there volcanic rocks during creation week? There's no biblical evidence of that. There's plenty of evidence, as we pointed out before, of granitic rocks being formed during creation week and also the third day. What about during the pre-flood time? Well, once again, uh, there's no clear indication. And why would I say that? Recall what scripture says about um, the fountains of the great deep 
and the eruption. And since we view the Bible as being a historical document, uh, accurate in those scientific areas that it talks about, let me go back uh, tonight just for a change. I'm going to read from the New American Standard Bible. And let's go back to Genesis 6, 7, and 8, the focus of the, of the flood. And so as we um, look at those uh, passages, um, we can go all the way to uh, chapter 7 and read a very important uh, uh, detail. Um, the last verse of uh, chapter 6 should be a, a goal for all of us in the Christian community. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. So Noah is an example to all of us of obeying uh, the commands of, of God. And so everybody goes into the ark um, uh, in the 600th year of Noah's life. They were on board the ark a year to Noah's 601st year. And so everybody's on board the ark all the way through Genesis chapter 7. And we come to the last verse of 7, which says, The water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. And then it goes down and talks about, in verse 2 of chapter 8, Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky uh, were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained. Now let's be careful that we're at chapter 8 here. We're midway into the flood, and notice what it says. And the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. So that passage tells us if we look back in 7 or 6, we will clearly find a passage where the floodgates of heaven were open and the fountains of the great deep were uh, erupting. Uh, Dr. Henry Morris, my mentor all those years ago in the 80s, always believed that water was an important part of what erupted in the fountains of the great deep. As I have studied it as a geologist and talked to my colleagues over the years, uh, we put a lot of stress on the fact that it was uh, lava flows and uh, volcanic activity and also the kind of volcanic activity that, that occurs at the edge of a plate as it is going underneath a continental mass. And so when we're talking about this, Let's go back to our uh, discussion that we've had in the past about rock tops. We've talked about that last week. So recall that igneous rocks fall into two categories, intrusive, as they're called, granites, or extrusive rocks. And so we know that the fountains of the Great Deep were uh, opened and then closed at a certain time, and what kind of extrusive volcanic rocks could have occurred then? And then what about in the post-flood time and all the way up to the modern time? We certainly see, as George has pointed out, a tremendous number of uh, subsea volcanoes and also eruptions in a place like Hawaii and other parts of the world. Well, we want to focus during the first hour on uh, basalt. Uh, a basalt is a, a black rock that uh, comes in a variety of flows and uh, provides some framework for us as we uh, think about some very important issues that tie into flood geology. For example, there are three types of uh, lavas. Uh, I'll test George about this on, in the second hour. But they are pillow basalts, a type of basalt that's named pohoi, which is a very ropey kind of 
basalt, a uh, name for a locality in Hawaii. And then if you're a crossword puzzle fan, George, you ever do crossword puzzles? Uh, yeah, I, I did while traveling in Europe in buses and trains, yep. Yes. Well, a short word for a volcanic rock are two A's. It's pronounced ah, ah, and that is a type of uh, basaltic lava. And so those three types provide some interesting uh, uh, discussion, um, and we'll focus later on on a type of basalt called a pillow basalt, which is a type of basalt that uh, forms when lava flows into water. Now, how in the world would that tie in to flood uh, geology? Well, it turns out that, pardon the pun, a debate has erupted uh, in the 21st century about whether Mount Ararat is actually the place where Noah's Ark landed. One of the geologic arguments uh, used for this by Tim Clary at ICR and others, Dr. Clary argues that Mount Ararat appears to be a active volcano um, late in the flood. And so his viewpoint is that the Ark could never have landed on an active volcano. It had to be someplace else. Well, I'm not sure of that because geologic research on Mount Ararat in eastern Turkey have shown up pillow basalts. And pillow basalts certainly occur as lava goes into water. Um, another uh, area of, uh, of intense interest around the world is the appearance of many of the lavas that flowed out during the time of the flood. Uh, these often have a columnar uh, appearance, and when they break off, they look like columns of some Greek temple or so forth. Um, these, these type of basalts are found in a number of areas. One area in America is what's called Devil's Tower National Monument. Um, we have spoken in the past and certainly argued uh, in, in my debate uh, uh, previously um, on the rapid radioactive decay rate and accelerated decay. We've talked about the basaltic flows in the country of India called the Deccan Traps. So we'll return to those. The um, chemical issue that George and I are going to discuss as we go through is the relationship between volcanic rocks and the amount of carbon dioxide that they put into the atmosphere. Well, as they erupted during the Great Flood, they probably put a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide into the um, ocean. And so let's go to our first uh, whiteboard here, so to speak, and write an equation from high school chemistry that I think we all can remember. If you have calcium, which is plus two, and you add bicarbonate, like baking soda, for example, and you put this bicarbonate in there, and I'm simply going to call that CO3 with a bracket around it. Can you see, George, that when I hold this up to the screen, <coughs> CaCO3, this is the mineral limestone. Uh, you've got calcium plus uh, carbonate, carbonate react, reacting to form uh, calcite. But if you actually use vinegar and soda and mix that in your kitchen, you'll notice that bubbles come off. Yep. Well, those bubbles are the gas CO2 yep. that re are reacting with between the acetic acid and the baking soda. Now, that CO2 puts a lot of... Um, chemical into the flood ocean that can end up being limestone. So I hope you can see that a number of the topics that we've covered over the last two months begin to fit together. So you've got this basaltic uh, lava 
that's putting a tremendous amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that has implications about the formation of glaciers and, and so forth. Um, and also uh, carbonate. Let me take a sip of coffee and then we'll turn to Hawaiian mythology, the book of Ezekiel and the book of uh, Isaiah. Clear my throat there a little bit. If you travel to Hawaii or study Hawaiian mythology, uh, you'll learn about a legend called Pele. There was a goddess, Pele, and supposedly she lives on Kilauea. That's the uh, big volcano on the big island in Hawaii. Saw it back in 85. And each eruption in that mythology, I don't know if you knew this, George, it's Pele longing to be with her lost, long, lost lover. And so there's a love component to this. Now, if you study it even more, you see a link between Pele and Satan. Why would I say that? It turns out that Pele is the daughter, one of the daughters, of the male god of the earth and the female goddess of the earth. Notice the numbers. Pele was one, but they had a total of six daughters and seven sons. That adds up to 13, which is a very well-known number when it comes to satanic uh, worship. Notice the concept of uh, love there. If you go, we're not going to do it tonight, but if you go to Ezekiel 28 and to Isaiah 14, you find a depiction of uh, Lucifer in those uh, uh, days or weeks or hours, however much it was, after he had been created a, a seraphim, a cherubim, and he was put in charge of a crystal cave, apparently, in underneath Eden. And he became very prideful about being around the uh, beautiful emeralds and rubies and so forth. And so this pumped him up. This brought him uh, pride. And so the sin of pride is indicated there. But also this theme of love and this theme of fire flows through both the Bible and also these volcanic legends about the goddess Pele because it was not love of a woman or a love of a man that drove uh, Lucifer. It was self-love. It was pride, the hubris that we, that we talk about. And so um, in, as you go around the world, We've talked about going around the world and looking at different legends about Noah's flood and the ark. Well, if you flip the coin to looking at Satan, uh, the, de the depiction of Satan is always that it's down, it's below, it's in the earth someplace. And so this volcanic uh, side of it makes it very interesting. I was privileged several years ago to spend several days at an archaeological dig near the Dead Sea. Now, George, let me test your geography knowledge here. What is so interesting about the Dead Sea there in Israel? Is it the highest place on earth or what? That's the saltiest place on earth. That's it's why the saltiest place. And also, elevation-wise, it's the lowest place. Oh, yes. Isn't, yeah. it, isn't it very interesting that the temptations of Christ talked about in uh, the Gospels occurred in the wilderness near the Dead Sea? And so Satan appeared to him in this uh, very... <clears throat> um, has my video frozen on you guys? Yes. Uh, yeah, I it looks know. like... It looks like at times, Professor McQueen, your video freezes a little bit and your audio lags. I'm curious, is your is your wife possibly using Wi-Fi or is anybody in the house using any of the no. Wi-Fi? No, she's not. Uh, uh, she's uh, simply on the telephone with our daughter, so it's not that. 
It's, um, it's anyway. manageable. It, it's fine. Yeah, it, it's it's okay. Very well. Coming clear um, for the most part. Okay, uh, so I'm saying that um, the idea of volcanoes associated with uh, Satan worship in these two passages, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, is worth looking into. I'm at the end of my 20 minutes now, so I'd like to turn the discussion over to uh, George and sit back and take notes about what he has been studying. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, David. Uh, can I share the screen, please? SFT. George, it would be an honor, brother. It would be an uh, honor. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I've got to remember how to do this. Yeah, click, share. All right. Uh, click, share. As you're doing okay, while Okay, uh, while he's sharing the screen, uh, George, at the university I used to teach at, they taught a introductory 100 class on earthquakes and volcanoes. You know what the, the young people called it? Oh, let's go to shake and bake. <laughs> earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, George, what is before you, I just wanted yeah. to point out to the audience that we've got a great chat tonight. Very lively. A lot of great questions coming in. So keep tagging me at Standing for Truth. I'm saving all your questions in our side chat and i'll make sure we get to all of them guys so thank you so much george your screen is shared your i can't hear i can't hear anything sft Yep, you're uh, George. Are you are you trying to play a video or something? Uh, George? No, 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 no. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't he hear you momentarily. There, I was actually going to tell you tell uh, David a really sick joke. Uh, what did the um, uh, baby volcano say to the mother volcano, David? Your eruption is too loud. No, it said magma. Magma. I love it. Pronounced in Australian. How uh, wonderful. Okay. All right. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the NASA, NASA actually predicted uh, something like about 10,000 or so volcanoes, but there are a couple of professors that, that actually state that there could, there could be 10 million underwater volcanoes. Now, just going, going on what uh, David mentioned earlier, uh, we know we know that the volcanoes are actually pumping awesome amounts of hot uh, basalt. Uh, this basalt is uh, up to 1,200 degrees centigrade. This is uh, this is a photograph, um, courtesy to NSF and uh, NOAA, there, uh, of a superheated uh, molten lava coming out of um, under the ocean somewhere. I'm not sure where it is. But uh, here it is. Um, in 2005, NASA was actually forced to admit that there were uh, might have been one million submarine volcanoes, or as many as 75 of those un underwater underwater behemoths saw half a mile above the surrounding seafloor, and several thousand of those in turn might be active. Now, here's the interesting part. I found this last night. Uh, two, two professors, a Professor Fisher and Professor Wheat, actually estimate the number of hydrothermally active seamounts at somewhere between 100,000 and 10 million hydrothermically active. This means they are heating the water. The two professors um, base their conclusion on, on the fact that a significant fraction of the seamounts already surveyed appear to be hydrothermically active. These seamounts are also huge. As many as a million of those planetary-sized hot water heaters have a diameter greater than seven kilometres and stand more than two kilometres high. That's that's unbelievable. I couldn't believe I had to read that twice when I first read it. But uh, yeah, you can find you can screenshot this and you can find the the entire paper by Fisher and uh, sorry, that's wheat, not white. Um, it's a it's titled Seamounts as Conduits for Massive Fluid Heat 
and solute fluxes and on ridge flanks. Now, these, these guys aren't quacks, okay? Uh, Professor Fisher is an Earth and Planetary Science Department and Institute for Geophysics and Planetary Physics in the University of California, Santa Cruz. And likewise, Jeffrey uh, Wheat, he, he is a research professor, Global Undersea Research Unit, University of Alaska, Fairbanks, based at Moss Landing in California, I think that is. So there's, if you want to read about it, there, that's the website called Ice Age Now. Uh, and you can see that they, although uh, detailed statistics are not kept on daily activity, uh, generally there are around 20 volcanoes actively erupting on any particular day. That comes from the, from the Smithsonian and the USGS. Uh, okay, look, volcanic eruptions uh, related um, and related processes have, have directly and indirectly benefited mankind. Volcanic materials ultimately break down and weather to form some of the most fertile soils on Earth. If anyone's been to Mount Servius um, outside of Naples in Italy, you'll know what I mean. They grow the best tomatoes you've ever seen. So um, what I've got to say is you ever wonder why if volcanic activity has been occurring for hundreds to billions of years and they produce these fertile soils, why is it we don't find these soils between any of the monolithic layers across the world? Uh, just some basic statistics there. Uh, in the U.S., uh, apparently the U.S. has the largest number of volcanoes, uh, totaling 173. Uh, Russia's next with 166. Indonesia has around 139. Iceland has 130. Greenland has 30 active volcanoes. Now, briefly, uh, David touched on the Ring of Fire. That, that rim that you see around the Pacific is what's termed the Ring of Fire, mainly because they're, they're active volcanoes. As you can see, Around the world, there are quite a few red dots there, which shows you how active Earth is. The next one here is uh, actually details the earthquakes and volcanoes uh, around the world. So notice, notice there those um, red dots along the mid-oceanic ridge and other parts of um, the oceans, deep oceans. Uh, here we go. This is what happens in a, in a case of a volcano. You've, you get hot magma somewhere around about um, five, 500 metres depth that literally uh, breaks through or explodes through this zone of confinement to create these mounds on either side, spewing out uh, gases. Now, the majority of those gases are actually water vapour, but... We'll talk about uh, some of the other gases a little bit later on. Here's a photograph which shows gases uh, coming from the ocean, deep ocean. Or in that case, I think it might be shallow ocean. So some, some of the largest, um, I think some of the people might know this, especially if you're, if you're from America, but the Yellowstone caldera is considered the biggest volcano uh, on Earth. Um, Mount Servius, as I mentioned, in Italy. Uh, this one's hard to pronounce. Popocatapetl in Mexico. Uh, Sakarujima in Japan. And the Galeras in Colombia. Okay, so we I'll stop sharing now and continue with my um, presentation. Um, just bear with me, find my spot here. Okay, one of the products that we've observed, oh, by the way, David, uh, with regards to basalt, the three types of basalt, I'll tell you what they yeah. are. Black ones, Please. gray ones, and I forgot the third one. Well, uh, there's a couple of <laughs> ways you can think about this. Um, if you're talking about overall uh, volcanic eruptions in a place like Mount St. Helens or a place like uh, Hawaii, you have the 
thick basalts, the pillow basalts, the pahoehoe, and the aa. But you also have very light uh, rocks uh, filled with gases. If it's white, it's called pumice. And yep. many people use these uh, cut down rocks to uh, exfoliate their skin. And then uh, the black version is called scoria. So pumice and scoria are very light uh, uh, volcanic rocks. In my days teaching high school earth science and also geology 101 in college, I would have a piece of uh, pumice, which I would toss out to one of the athletes in the audience. And he would think he was going to catch something heavy. It was very light. So your point is uh, well taken, George, about that. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, SFT. I need, I need to share the screen again just to show uh, some pictures of something I'm going to actually describe uh, in a minute. Um, so, No problem. Uh, I think I know how to do this now. Yeah, looks like you've mastered it, George. Okay. Uh, one, one of the things we find in a, um, a volcanic eruption is um, – Extrusive igneous rocks, uh, mainly rhyolite, and I want to talk about rhyolite. Uh, it's the equivalent. It's it's the volcanic equivalent of granite. Okay, we know we know that when granite is molten and allowed to cool, it forms rhyolite. Now this is a a picture of what rhyolite looks like. Okay, and I want to show you that that's um, it doesn't always look exactly like that but these are different versions of it and one of the amazing things i found out that uh, rhyolite is actually they, they've actually used um, rhyolite to um, make arrowheads and spearheads now this is what granite now keep in mind the, that photo i showed you of the rhyolite these are photos of granite okay you notice the um the various minerals there and um their, their sort of distribution, they're evenly distributed. Okay, so we go back to the rhyolite. There's rhyolite. There's granite. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, or in previous streams, I should say, granite is composed of those four minerals we uh, keep talking about, the uh, mica, the quartz, the feldspar, and horns pleb. Is, is that correct, David? Uh, yeah, let me help you with that. Um, the, um, yeah. the orange in a granite is orthoclase feldspar, potassium feldspar. The quartz and the feldspar, the white feldspars. The dark minerals are micas, like biotite. And then the other minerals are horn blends, and pyroxenes, more complicated silicate minerals. Go ahead, George. Yeah, yeah. The, the interesting part about uh, those photos, though, was the evenly distributed nature of those uh, minerals. And as we've spoken previously, in the secular model, where Earth was a molten ball of rock for 500 to 800 million years, we know, we know that each one of those minerals has a different specific uh, gravity or density. After, after 500 to 800 million years, you would expect the heavier minerals to have sunk lower and the lighter ones to be further up the top. But that's not what we notice. In the granite, we find an even distribution of those minerals which sort of puts uh, a big question mark around their model. Okay, one of the things, one of the other things that uh, they recently found was um, uh, um, a substance called ringwoodite. It was discovered after a volcano in Brazil spewed out, a, believe it or not, a diamond that had ringwoodite encased inside of it. The, the, this this little tiny piece of ringwoodite apparently was carrying an astonishingly large amount of water. Yeah, of course, scientists could help but be intrigued by the interesting new mineral. They never knew about this. Apparently, ringwoodite was uh, was um, was named after I think I was an Australian geologist by the name of Mr. Ringwoodite. 
Uh, Ringwood, sorry, Ringwood. So they named the Ringwood diet. So the, the Ringwood diet is like a, a sponge. Uh, it's, it soaks up water. Uh, there is something very special about this crystal structure, though. It allows it to attract hydrogen and trap water. Uh, the mineral can contain a lot of water under conditions of the deep mantle, and I'll explain a little bit about that. So, scientists have determined that ringwoodite is is approximately of of uh, red 1.5 to about 3% water. It's it's present not as a liquid but as a hydroxide ion, that is oxygen and hydrogen molecules bound together. Uh, th these results suggest there could be a vast store of water in the mantle transition zone, which stretches. Now, th th I've seen various uh, figures here, but uh, let's let's stick with four, between 410 to about 660 kilometres uh, down into the earth. Uh, <coughs> uh, you'll find some articles on ringwoodite. Some even suggest there could be th three times as much uh, subsurface water stored in these terrains. Now, for those that don't know what ringwoodite would look like, and I'll share the screen again. While he's sharing it, I drew a sketch of what the evolutionary prediction on granite would be. And notice that the deep time prediction would have very thick um, layers of large crystals at the bottom going up to smaller crystals. So your grain size argument is quite good, George. Oh, thank you. SFT, uh, am I sharing that uh, that photo of the... You're Sorry, good. There? Yeah, yep. there. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that's what uh, the ringwoodite looks like. I know it's a bit boring, but bear with me. <laughs> okay, so... How much water is there on Earth? Uh, you you can find you can find these figures um, even on on Wikipedia. So there, there's there's roughly one point three eight six by ten to the twenty first kilograms or liters of water. Now, for those that uh, don't know, one liter of water is one kilogram. So yeah, you can equate the two. Uh, I'll leave that uh, for a, for a few moments. So if you want to take a screenshot. I found this on the United States uh, Geological uh, Survey site. This is the total volume uh, that they probably estimate um, of all sources of water on Earth. But notice they don't inclu include the potential water stored in um, Iringwadite. So, so what I've done is I've done a little calculation there. So how much uh, water is there on Earth if you consider the water stored in the ringwoodite. Well, some some uh, papers that I've read, as, uh, as you can see there, uh, suggest that um, th these these minerals, that is the was wadsleyite and the ringwoodite, can contain uh, up to seven percent of the planet. Uh, sorry, comprise about seven percent of the planet's mass, but only about two percent of their weight is water. Now. You can do the, the maths yourself. That's the mass of the Earth there, 5.9722 times 10 to the 24th kilogram. That's from a Wikipedia um, uh, source. So if you do it, take 7% of that, you get uh, 4.2 by 20, 10 to the 23rd power kilogram. And 2% of that is 8.4 by 10 to the 21st uh, kilogram or litres. So the total the total water on Earth, as mentioned previously, of one point three eight six by ten to the twenty one, and the potential water stored in ringwoodite is somewhere around eight point four by ten to the twenty first. That's a total of nine point seven eight six. Now, bear in mind, not not all that two percent, uh, because because it includes both Wadsleyite and ringwoodite. I was unable to determine exactly um, what component of ringwoodite actually consists of. So that two percent is based on both of those uh, two minerals. But even even though you can see how large that number is, now we're going to go into the gases. 
Um, as I stated earlier, the primary gas during a volcano is actually water vapour, uh, H2O. This is a, a little diagram or an illustration which shows you some of the um, gases that can come out of uh, a volcano. Um, it's interesting that they say that 99% of the gas molecules emitted during a volcanic eruption are water vapour, that is H2O, carbon dioxide CO2 and sulphur dioxide SO2. The remaining 1% is comprised of small amounts of hydrogen sulphide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride and other minor, minor gas species. Now, now we're going to get into a little uh, bit of nitty gritty. Uh, stop sharing. When we look at uh, some of the um, numbers for these eruptions, they they uh, estimate that in 1991, during the eruption of the Mount Pinatubu, is thought to have injected more than 250 megatons of gas into the upper atmosphere on a single day. Uh, here's some other facts. The most abundant volcanic gas, as we said, is water vapour, which is harmless, of course. However, significant amount of carbon dioxide, sulphur dioxide, hydrogen sulphide and hydrogen halides can also be emitted. A bit of trivia, uh, for those that remember um, hydrogen, uh, sorry, high school uh, chemistry, Hydrogen sulfide is rotten gas, rotten egg gas. Yeah. Now, as the odor. Yeah. Now, I found I found a number of other statistics that that vary quite a bit. Um, they say in an average year, this is from all vo volcanoes, they release between 180 and 440 million tons of carbon dioxide. That's just over, that's just for the 1,500 volcanoes. Now imagine the CO2 that's spewed out by those 10 million volcanoes those two professors were talking about. Now, I've, George, I've read... forgive, forgive the interruption. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're coming up to the 50-minute mark, and I want to get a couple of questions in before we take the yeah. one-hour break. Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've only got a couple of minutes to, to uh, finish it off. Okay. Uh, now, now, even today, the volcanic output of CO2, this is from another another web, website, suggests that it's been estimated about 6.6 .6 million tonnes per year, while calculations based on past eruptions, right, they've looked at past eruptions, and the most recent volcanic deposits in the rock record suggest as much as a staggering 44 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. And the reason I, why I mention carbon dioxide is because of limestone. But I won't talk about limestone at this stage. So I'll, I'll hand the mic back to um, Professor McQueen. Okay. And uh, we can get his um, interpretation of what I've actually stated here. Well, very good. We'll uh, look at that in more detail next hour. Uh, I wanted to comment about one thing that's on my private chat. One cow stampede. Uh, do you see his comment to me, uh, standing for truth, about the TOBA, the Toba super yep. eruption? I want to read that. I want to defer read that to the audience. I want to defer that to after the one hour break and take another question. But I do want to show this diagram. Sure. So this, I drew this off. This is the deep time prediction of what a granite should look like. Very large crystals down. You see, I've got my arrow there showing up. And then a gradation as you go through. As George correctly pointed out, that's not what you find in the rock record. Okay, staying for truth. Let's, let's have a question from the audience other than this one about Toba. I want to save that for later. Okay. Okay. So we'll save the um, Toba um, eruption for after the break. Let's see some of these questions. Let's go with, um, here's a question from, 
Okay, here's a here's a question that I'm sure you get all the time, Professor McQueen. The critics say there is not enough water on the planet for there to have been a global flood. <laughs> How do we best respond to that? Okay, well, <laughs> such a common. Uh, the data that George just presented, especially about this uh, uh, fascinating mi mineral ringwoodite, uh, ties in with other uh, minerals that have a tremendous amount of water in their crystal structure. It reminds me of Colossians, the book of Colossians, where it, it teaches that uh, the uh, that the world was formed uh, with water and in water. And so the idea in Colossians, the idea in certain in first second Peter uh, three is that God created a tremendous amount of water in this in these mineral structures. But if we go beyond that to the uh, predictions that Dr. Henry Morris made in the 1950s that George has talked so well about uh, uh, tonight, there's a tremendous amount of H2O tied into the volcanic uh, eruptions, the lavas. And so uh, the idea that there's not enough water on earth right now uh, is uh, it's almost comical to me geologically. It's it's at the same level of people saying, I have driven a Chevy since the 1970s, and so somehow I put out enough carbon dioxide to alter the world's climate. When you've got volcanoes, like George has pointed out, that have put millions of kilograms millions of liters of, uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so uh, the argument about not enough being, I'm sorry, the argument where you, you can't have the amount of water in the current ocean and so forth, it just doesn't add up, does it, George? No, it's, no, it's no. I'd, I'd like to add something to that too, uh, David, based on those verses of the Bible that you mentioned. Dr. Russell Humphreys was, was actually in trying to determine the, uh, gra uh, the gravities of the various planets. He actually, uh, his theory looked at um, the H2O mo molecule and looked at the alignment, considering that he w he thought that God would have provide would have created an Earth where the H two O molecules were aligned perfectly, and by by actually calculating the um, the forces between them, he was able to estimate the the gravity not only of of Earth but the gravities of a number of other planets in our solar system. Now some of them aren't perfect. That that's mainly because the composition of those planets wasn't known at the time. Yes. Yeah. So that's an interesting fact that uh, he used the water molecule to determine the gravity of these various planets. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, the next question on your end, Standing for Truth, please. Yes, we've got a, a super chat from Raman. Thank you so much for your support. We've got a lot of super stickers coming in as well, guys. Thanks so much for your support. God bless you. Uh, that's amazing. And uh, Raman gives a $5 super chat with a question for you, Professor McQueen. Okay. Is a popular catalyst to the Ice Age, does it have to do with volcanoes? And then um, he asks, ash blocks sunlight, for example. Right. So what's the correlation right. between volcanoes and, and the Ice okay. Age, in other words? Uh, in the last month, I think you've had Michael Ord on talking about the Ice Age. And the uh, simplest way, he gave a very long dis description. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Larry Vardaman, who's retired now in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, had a uh, explanation that he used when we would uh, talk about this in the Grand Canyon trips and so forth about the Ice Age. The conditions of the, of the Great Flood, the conditions of this heat that we've talked about generated by catastrophic plate tectonics and so forth uh, in previous discussions. That heat uh, modified the Earth's uh, climate in the hundreds of years, not 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but in the hundreds of years after the time of the flood. And so that uh, tremendous amount of heat that was put in, into the uh, newly formed atmosphere, keep in mind that whatever the vapor canopy was in the pre-flood world, it wasn't an atmosphere like we have now. Why? No rain fell. Water came up from the ground. And so it was a new uh, hydro system, uh, hydrologic cycle you may remember from um, uh, earth science uh, classes uh, previously. And so when you look at this from the standpoint of flood geology, um, that ash being thrown up into the atmosphere, that ash uh, component that we'll talk more about as we come along, uh, all of these factors, the heat, the ash, precipitated the continental glaciation that you see 100, 200 years after the end of the flood. Most Bible scholars believe that the, uh, uh, the book of Job, or Job himself, uh, saw evidence of ice and snow and glaciers in his day after the flood. Uh, okay, can I, back can I, to you, Standing for Truth. Can I, can I add a little bit to that? Um, based, based on those submarine volcanoes that I mentioned and my, and my very limited knowledge of climate uh, science, you'd expect uh, hot water to initiate more evaporation. More evaporation leads to more rainfall. And, of course, with the ash uh, in the upper atmosphere, that would create a colder climate. And so instead of water or instead of rain, you'd get snow falling. So that's, exactly. that's how I, I would explain it as well, because um, uh, I, I know in particular with uh, Australia, whenever we get hot streams of water coming from the Antarctic along the east coast, we, yes. expect, we expect wet weather, and that's what we get. However, the reverse occurs if, if there are cold streams of water coming from the Antarctic along the east coast, there's less evaporation, and we actually get very hot weather. Interesting. That's an interesting yeah. aspect of climate. Yeah. Standing for truth, may I ask uh, permission to take my five-minute break, and you and George carry the ball. And when I come back, we'll talk about this uh, question about T-O-B-A or TOBA. Can you awesome. drop a video, my friend? Absolutely. That was a great first hour, fast paced. And gentlemen, I just want to say great job. Uh, that was a ton of amazing information. So Professor McQu uh, McQueen, you've earned a well-deserved break. So here we are. Okay. So, uh, First off, George, before I hand it over uh, to you, um, there's a few questions in the live chat with, uh, so Hate Love Nothing says, is your merchandise clothes available on Amazon? No, not yet, unfortunately. Our books are all available on Amazon, uh, but our merchandise is just available on our website, creationistclothing.com. Uh, if anybody hasn't yet seen it, I made a video a few days ago. Uh, walk through through the standing for truth ministry as in i went over um our different websites uh, the best way to navigate the youtube channel if you're looking for specific topics i went to our creationist clothing website where we are uploading articles as well as video posts uh guiding you guys on how to go to the search bar looking for specific topics so definitely check out that video if you had not yet uh, checked it out, I went over some updates and reminders over the next couple months in terms of uh, shows, in terms of debates, interviews, discussions. I myself will be having next week's going to be busy because we've got um, we've got a few good shows and we're working on possibly having um, Ken Hoven. He's back on with us next month. You can see uh, scheduled. I'm just going to my schedule here. Um, he's back on next month on the 20th. Uh, our amazing award-winning co-host George is going to be there because it's going to be lies in the textbooks. Very similar to uh, the last presentation Kent gave us on 
uh, the Garden of Eden and Noah's Flood. So he's going to give a presentation followed by an audience uh, Q&A. So please bring your questions for that show. On the 7th of May, we've got Matt Slick back with us debating Dr. Ron Garrett. Round two. I'm excited for that one. Uh, evidence for Christianity. But as I was saying, next week's big because on the 27th, I'll be debating Bill Tavis. It's going to be an origins debate. Does all life share common ancestors? That's going to be a lot of fun. And the very next day, we've got Dr. Dan Biddle back with us. And on the 29th, the very next day after Dr. Dan Biddle, we, we've got Dr. Gordon Wilson with us. So tons of great shows. And yeah, I just wanted to get everybody up to date. George, you're doing a great job in this in this uh, program. Lots of great information. I'm going to hand it over to you, brother. That was our Dr. Dan, not the other Dr. Dan, right? Yeah, not... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Not uh, Dr. Dodgeball Dan, no. <laughs> uh, I was just looking at some of the uh, questions in the private chat. Um, how does the flood explain the existing the existence of mountains? I think uh, there, there are a number of ways you can actually uh, answer that uh, because there's not just one explanation for the existence of the mountains. Uh, one is, of course, we, we know from uh, flood geology that uh, layers um, are deposited via, via water. Uh, but you've got to understand that during that flood, there was a lot of catas catastrophic uh, movement of plates in the horizontal direction, sometimes in, in opposite directions. So, and you can see this in some mountains where you get folded layers. That's one way you can actually create a mountain. But the other one, of, uh, the obvious one is, of course, the uh, eruption of volcanoes they can also uh, form um, uh, mountains as well and just natural tectonic plate movements we know that um, the himalayas are, are growing because of that tectonic uh, plate movement and um, yeah i think uh, maybe professor mcqueen might want to add something to that when he comes back but from my point of view there are a number of ways uh, you can explain the existence of uh, of the mountains. Those are some great points, brother. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the rapid uplifting of the mountains and explanations that uniformitarians have when it comes to plate tectonics, as always, they're, they're assuming uniformitarian processes. The present is the key to the past. But when we're looking to the flood event, we're looking to continental sprint. It's no longer continental drift. Today, what we see is continental drift. But at the time of the flood, we'd have meters per second movements of the plates. And that can best explain the rapid buckling and uplifting of the, of the strata to create these large mountains to begin with. Because what we see today present processes can explain those geological features that require catastrophic processes, catastrophic meters per second plate movements. And typically the evolutionists will scoff at that. But I always point to the fact that we've made testable predictions that have confirmed this with the cold slabs that was predicted due to runaway subduction right? If these plates are being pushed down, then obviously they would not have had time to melt. And after this was predicted, the data revealed these enormous slabs of cool rock at the base of the mantle that have not yet warmed up to the surrounding material. In other words, they are cool. And uh, this is indication that they were pushed down there only thousands of years ago as compared to millions of years ago. This indicates what, George? catastrophic processes in the past and we've pointed out in the past it's like two cars coming at each other at 100 kilometers an hour what you're going to get with that tremendous force is is rapid uh uplifting due to the buckling that would take place but if you had two cars coming at each other at one kilometer an hour there's going to be no there's going to be no buckling and therefore no uplifting so the uh, continental sprint the catastrophic plate tectonics model best explains the existence of mountains and best explains these geological features that require catastrophic processes. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, George? Well, yes, and, and the other interesting point is if there was a heat problem, 
you wouldn't find those cold plates. That puts a nail to that heat problem issue, yeah. <laughs> You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> so you just <laughs> seen the movements of me laughing. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's a great point, brother, because uh, the prediction was made based on the flood model. Then the prediction was confirmed. And guess what? They weren't completely melted as they should be, or at least warmed up according to the uniformitarian model. But the fact that they're there, once again, shows that there's obviously a multitude of ways to resolve the so-called heat problem. And that's why we constantly point out here on this channel, George, that heat is not a bug, it's a feature. Heat and energy help get the plates moving in the first place. Heat and energy help with the rapid, rapid production of coal, oil and natural gas where the heat would be rapidly absorbed as uh, Joseph Hubbard has covered and the existence of radio halos, fishing tracks, right? These scars in the rocks themselves wouldn't be there if there was as much heat as the evolutionists claimed there was. That much heat would obliterate those radio halos and fishing tracks. So the evidence is overwhelmingly on our side. What are your thoughts, George? It, it, exactly. Uh, I was going to present some um, some information on limestone a little bit later and uh, how it relates to the volcanoes. Uh, I'll just briefly mention it. One of the things that they actually have found with regard to this climate change business, by injecting carbon dioxide into um, into the mantle where, where it's hot, they can actually convert that carbon dioxide into limestone. But I won't say any more about that. I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, welcome back, uh, Professor McQueen. Thank you so much. I uh, wanted to uh, address this uh, question by one cow stampede about the Toba eruption. Let's get our geography uh, straight. Uh, this is a volcanic area uh, on Sumatra. <laughs> in Indonesia, and um, the uh, area has been volcanically active for many years. The focus of the um, Toba super eruption is that it uh, occurred in such a way that uh, it wasn't that long ago in geologic time maybe 75,000 years ago. And the theory regarding this is that it put so much ash in the uh, sky that it uh, uh, produced what is called a volcanic winter, perhaps lasting a thousand years. Now, we would need to look at the geology of that part of Sumatra, a part of the world that I do not have memorized, but let's assume that this volcano occurred in the time immediately after the flood. That amount of volcanic ash in the sky and that kind of what they term a volcanic winter would actually uh, spiral to form the um, continental glaciation time that in my teaching, I always, instead of calling it the ice ages, I call it the ice moment to give it the idea of being several hundred years in duration, not otherwise. So thank you for that question. And uh, we will go on now to uh, the next uh, topic. Uh, Standing for Truth, you want to take one more question before I introduce another idea? Yes, we. Uh, that's a great response, Professor McQueen, as, as always. Um, I love how informative your responses are to these questions. One question we had that uh, George and I kind of touched on while you were away, Professor McQueen, was how does the flood exactly explain the existence of mountains? And we discussed okay. rapid plate tectonics. So I'm not sure if you exactly. wanted to uh, add a few things to that, but that is one yeah. of the questions. Well, uh, let me give a five-minute response. And then uh, in July or August, we really, George, should do a whole session 
on that part of geology that's called tectonics or structural geology. Yes. That actually talks about mountain building, the uh, mountains, uh, the Appalachian Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, the uh, the Alps. Uh, we could have a whole session on that. That would be fun, wouldn't it, George? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think we've got something like about 30 other topics to discuss. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, but can add, well, me, we can add that let one. Me quick, uh, let me give the quick uh, version of it. Um, a volcano is obviously a mountain. Mount St. Helens is a mountain. Mount Ararat at 17,000 feet is a volcanic peak. It's a, clearly a volcanic uh, rock. And so not a volcanic rock, a volcanic mountain. And the others that George mentioned worldwide, uh, Mount Fuji and uh, other places on Earth, uh, these are volcanic peaks. So the fact that we have volcanic mountains ties into today's topic, but other mountains, and one of my favorite mountains in this regard, is Mount Everest itself. Very tall, tallest mountain on the in the on the world, and early flood geologists. I'm talking about guys that were thinking about this in the 1920s and 1930s. They made a, a very big deal that if you climb up the apex of Mount Everest, let me get it turned right. As you got up uh, 10,000, 20,000 feet up you would find uh, fossils. And so the early flood geologists would say, oh, that's an evidence of worldwide flood. These uh, uh, shells like we showed last week, <clears throat> like a oyster shell like this, called a plesiopod, a plesiopod found on Mount Everest would be an evidence of the flood. Well, not when described that way. And the reason is this. I think that the most reasonable flood geology model has the maximum height of a pre-flood mountain at about 10,000 feet. The fossils that you find uh, on Mount Everest, for example, and we can use this clam here again, these were deposited flat lying like this. Get it horizontal to the screen here. And so south of India, south of Nepal, these were forming during the time of the flood. And then as the flood hit, catastrophic plate tectonics moved those mountains to the current height that we see. And then the layers in the mountains contain these rocks kind of like between my fingers here. So here you've got Mount Say, Mount. <laughs> You've got Mount Everest, and the fossils are in between. That's the reason you find them there, not because they're stuck on like uh, makeup on a beautiful woman's face. Ms. McQueen comes to mind, of course. Um, the uh, Trying to make George laugh, but he's not even listening. Um, the idea that you have these fossils stuck like makeup on the face of the mountain that's an incorrect way to think about it. They're incorporated in the actual rocks themselves. Makes they, sense, standing for truth. Yeah, they 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 find they find clams in the Andes as well, don't they? Yes, they do. And, <laughs> uh, the one of the points that uh, uh, Andrew Snelling has made for years, and Dr. Gary Parker and Ken Ham have actually made this argument for decades, is that every continent is covered in part by marine invertebrate fossils. And so one of the basic arguments for the worldwide flood is you've got these continental masses called cratons, and you've got the uh, sedimentary rocks on top of it. And so I think the, the Great Flood actually provides the best explanation for mountain chains worldwide. Standing for truth, let's go back and pick up another question. Dave, Dave Ed, 
uh, nature calls for me. Uh, are you able to address this question it, by Crimson Air? He says, does young earth creationism necessarily entail accelerated nuclear decay? Okay, uh, we, can, we can go to that and approach it in two different ways. The first way that we can approach it is we have argued as creation scientists for a hundred years, actually, as flood geologists, we have argued that we are doing science by the same basic rules as the deep time opponents, the evolutionary geologists are, are doing. What do I mean by that? We are developing what's called a multiple working hypothesis. And one of these uh, multiple working hypotheses that we have is that catastrophic plate tectonics is an integral part of flood geology. Even before uh, people like Professor Baumgardner and others were suggesting catastrophic plate tectonics, if you go back to the early 80s, there were creation scientists that were saying, okay, we can have continental separation without modern plate tectonics. Now, what did they mean by that? If you look at the mid-ocean ridge and you focus between, let's say, South America and Africa, you can measure the amount of lava that's coming up in these uh, things that uh, George talked about. Remember, George talked about, let me get my sheet of paper, the notes there. He talked there, he talked about uh, there may be as many as 100,000 to uh, 10 million black smokers. Now, black smoker is a word that a geologist would use. Uh, the oceanographer would simply call these small volcanic vents. At any rate, if you look at that, the amount of lava that's added is one or two centimeters a year. Um, there is a claim that I still want to see verified that by putting a laser in West Africa and in Eastern Brazil, you can shoot a line across the uh, South Atlantic and can actually measure this two centimeter or four centimeter separation. I've never really been convinced of that because from my understanding, George, in the past, that's within the standard deviation of error of the method. But forget about that. The, the point is that the idea of uh, the separation of the continents during the Great Flood, even in the days before um, the idea of catastrophic plate tectonics, was widely held by flood geologists. Now, again, why would I use the word um, multiple working hypotheses? Well, in Dr. Henry Morris's day, he studied geology in the 40s and the 50s. And during that period of time, there was what was called the geosynclinal explanation of mountain building, where you had, let me get this going correctly here, you had deep basins that filled with sediments, and then they began to exert forces of what was called isostasy, still called it, the movement of uh, plates up and down. So I would argue that flood geology is an excellent form of science. If you want to talk about ice creams, vanilla and chocolate and strawberry, it's true the evolutionary community, the deep time people have an explanation, so they think, for mountain building. But I think the other flavors of vanilla and chocolate in the <laughs> models of flood geology are much better. George? I, I like I like vanilla. Yeah, and I like uh, strawberry, so that'll be good. <laughs> I... Uh... I'm sorry, David, but I missed most of your uh, your answer because uh, I had to run um, to the restroom. But I'm yeah, it's not, I'm not a problem. We uh, we'll carry on here. Um, 
Uh, George, I think uh, this would be a good time for us to move into the relationship between volcanic activity and the formation of limestones during the flood. You oh, want to kick was... that off and I'll pick up after you? Yeah, yeah, I was going to suggest that. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, SFT is there, but but I, I can I can briefly talk about it. Um, yes, uh, no, of this course, is, yeah. Now, th this isn't just creationist hype, okay? This, this, this is backed up by actual science. What some scientists did um, in order to, to solve this particular carbon dioxide problem in the atmosphere, they looked at various ways where they can actually dispose of it deep into the earth. Yes. And they were surprised when they injected it uh, and I can show you, I can share my screen and show you um, the depths involved. When they injected it into um, molten lava, they were surprised that it actually turned into limestone. And a, a number of uh, papers have been written on that since that particular time, both from uh, creationists as well as secular uh, scientists as well. Now, uh, just some statistics here. Carbonates comprise 20 to 25% of the total sedimentary strata and can be quite thick. Uh, for example, the red, uh, red wall limestone in um, the Grand Canyon is, I believe, approximately 400 to about 800 feet thick. But uh, some carbonates can exceed 3,000 feet, I believe. Uh, and there's a reference to that if uh, anyone wants to know. Uh, apparently, carbonate rocks also contain about one third of the world's oil deposits and are an important source uh, of construction materials. Just a bit of trivia for you. Now, there, yeah. are, there are many varieties of calcium carbonates, and David wrote the formula there with CaCO3. Ca is the calcium. CO3 is the carbonates. Uh, for the original limestone, so, um, sorry, they're, they're, the varieties are, um, the various varieties of the or, for the origin of limestone are calcite, aragonite, uh, vaterite, uh, chalk, oblique, obliques, pisoliths, uh, travertine, invitee, and marble. I hope I got them more. I hope I got them all right, uh, David. I think I, I butchered some of the uh, translations there, or the uh, that's that's not a problem. Recall that marble is a metamorphic rock, but the rest yeah. of what you said are minerals incorporated in sedimentary rock. And those of you that are following our discussion chemically, CaCO three is the calcite. We're talking about a tremendous amount of volcanic activity putting. Uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that relates to one of the things that George and I have emphasized in the past called the partial pressure of this gas. When you add that to the temperature and the pH of the uh, ocean of Noah's day, what I mean is the ark was above it and there was an ocean underneath it. You've got some good possibilities there, don't you, George? Oh, def definitely. I mean, just just uh, for the audience, um, I think we've mentioned this a few times in a number of previous streams, but uh, these um, limestone deposits are actually over vast areas. Um, and, and I'm talking like they extend from England through to the mainland Europe, Middle East to the Americas, and even way down to Australia, believe it or not. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, uh, this is a this is a phys physics dot org paper. Okay, it's it's titled "Researchers Find Carbon Reacts with Basalt Can Form Carbonate Minerals Faster Than Thought." Who would have thought? Eh? Who would have thought? Yes, it, that's it, true. It it, 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 it 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 says mixing carbon dioxide with water and pumping it into underground basalt formations in Iceland has resulted in 80% of the carbon being sequestered into carbonate materials within one year's time. This is a phys.org paper, people. 
Yeah. Now, those of you that are following this in the Standing for Truth audience need to recall over the last couple of months that critics of things that George and I have said have said, oh, George, oh, David, you can't explain the direct precipitation of limestone during the time of the flood, the great uh, huge cliffs of Dover, the um, uh, issues of uh, the Austin chalk, all these chalks. People say, oh, you need millions of years to get this accumulation. Can you see that the data that George just presented about uh, the reaction of carbon dioxide with basalts producing calcium carbonate right at that interface between the lava and the ocean water. It's a good argument, isn't it, George? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's another paper here from Science Nordic. Uh, they say, um, a quote, we dissolved the CO2 in water, making it heavier than the liquid already down there. The solution then dissolves the 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 bas the rock. This is the basalt rock, and reacts with the CO2 and rapidly forms calcium carbonate. In in the basalt, the CO2 is converted so quickly that it doesn't have the opportunity to escape through cracks in the rock. It's oh, incredible. Very good. It's very incredible good. that it can happen so quickly. Says right. Paulson, one of the scientists. That's so good. Now, George, notice that we're at the hour and a half mark here. So why don't we take a couple more questions from the audience standing for truth and uh, we'll move on to our last 30 minutes here. Okay. Well, we've got um, a super chat here from Raman. Thank you so much for the super chat. The chat's been great tonight. There's been a ton of good comments and feedback from the chat, uh, Professor McQueen and George. So uh, Raman says, there are many fossil auction websites. Evos, please <coughs> choose one fossil in limestone you think happened in a long time. Um, okay, now I'll, I'll comment about that. The fossil auction websites are generally run by people that are deep time uh, uh, believers. But keep in mind, that a great many of the entrepreneurs that run these fossil and mineral uh, auctions online are fellows that are uh, retired truck drivers and retired civil engineers that simply are entrepreneurs. <laughs> they have uh, bought a bunch of these fossils. Uh, when they buy them, it's got written on it, oh, this fossil is 500 million years old or this fossil is... Um, uh, uh, 400 million years old. And let me tell you the way it works. If you buy a fossil limestone that is rich in trilobites, for example, uh, the assumption will be is always the circular index fossil argument. You find a fossil limestone that's got a tremendous number of trilobites in it. It must be Cambrian or Ordovician. It must be part of what Tim Clary calls the sulk sequence. And so this has to be in deep time, evidence of 500 or 600 million years. In flood geology, using Tim Clary as an example, the sulk sequence is simply the first uh, rocks laid down by the flood. So I hope you can see how if you choose one fossil, like a trilobite, you get one age, so to speak. If you uh, find a fossil bearing, let me see what I did with my clam here. Uh, well, here's a, well, that's a bad example. Uh, let me just speak it. If you find a, a fossil bearing limestone in South Florida or in the Bahamas, that's rich in clams or plesiopods, snails called gastropods, the assumption would be that these would just be 35 million years old. So back to you, Standing for Truth. Can I, sure, can I, just add, can I, can I add a bit of uh, what David said? Um, 
Uh, it, it, for those that probably don't know, I mean, I don't know where Kansas is, but uh, the Neobrara chalk in Kansas apparently contains uh, an even more impressive list of uh, these larger fossils. And I'm talking about fish of various types up to five metres long, which is about 16 feet. There's uh, sharks and turtles up to four metres long, blizziosaurs up to 14 metres long, Moss, mosasaurs up to 15 metres long, torosaurs with wingspans up to 30 feet or 9 metres, and dinosaurs such as ankylosaurs and hadrosaurs up to, up to 9 metres and birds up to 2 metres. So there's an impressive list of these fossils yeah. that have been found in chalk. Yeah. Now, that can't George, have happened you, uh, over thousands of years. George, when you come to visit me in Louisiana, we can drive northwest of Louisiana for about a day and we'll end up in Kansas. So uh, <laughs> we will uh, we will end up in Kansas. We'll try not to be like Dorothy on The Wizard of Oz and at the end of the time saying, oh, we're not in Kansas anymore, if you're aware <laughs> of that movie. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so great responses, brothers. Uh, question here. It's a two-part question from Hate Love Nothing. So I appreciate your questions. He asks, are there any fossils in, at, or near volcanoes? And secondly, are there <laughs> any geological occurrences or mechanisms that defy our expectations? Okay. Well, let me take the first part of that. Um, if there were uh, clams and plesiopods near the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii, as that lava flows to the ocean and might come close to these calcium carbonate, these uh, creatures made of calcium carbonate shells, like a clam or a snail, that lava is flowing and cooling down from 2,000 degrees. So it would take into solution um, the clams and the snails. So it's a very rare occurrence that you would find a fossil in volcanic rock. As a matter of fact, when you go actually into the field, and I began my field work in geology uh, in 1970, when you actually go out in the field and you find a fossil, uh, you immediately say that's a sedimentary rock and you dismiss metamorphic and uh, volcanic rocks. Okay, uh, George, you want to add to that? Yeah, well, that's correct. I mean, uh, I think uh, vol volcanic uh, basalt is, um, uh, from memory, 1,200 degrees centigrade. And that's molten. I mean, imagine if 1,200 degrees centigrade can melt rock, what it will do to flesh and bone. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And um, the uh, uh, repeat uh, standing for truth, the second part of that question, I, I got lost there in the second part. No problem. Uh, great response. Let me go back to it here. Okay. So the second part to that question was, are there any geological occurrences or mechanisms that defy our expectations? Okay, let's, uh, let's frame it this way. What in geology goes against the idea of deep time and uh, traditional geology? Well, one uh, part of geology that deals with mountain building certainly is defies the physics and the engineering of, uh, of rocks. If you travel worldwide, you see in some areas an anticline and in other areas what's called a syncline or rocks that are folded in this way. The Appalachian Mountains are very common all over the earth that's common. George is the perfect scientist to, 
talk about this from the standpoint of engineering, and we'll use the example uh, that we've used before. Here's my rigid cell phone. This is a lithified rock like we're made to believe that the rocks were fully lithified before the uh, mountains began to be formed in the Appalachians or the Rockies. Tell us once again, as you've told us before, George, if I applied pressure to a rigid object like my cell phone, would it fold or would it fracture? You wouldn't have a working phone, I can tell you that much. That's right. It wouldn't be running <laughs> off the time like that. And so the, uh, the argument is the presence of anticlines and synclines is an argument from rock mechanics, what George would call structural mechanics, Young's modulus, compressive stress, shear stresses that he's dealt with in his engineering background. In my background of rock mechanics, this argues against an old earth interpretation of mountain building. There, there, there are other contradictions um, as well. Uh, I mean, they, they all tell us that birds evolved from dinosaurs around 100 million years ago. But there are fossil bird tracks found in carboniferous layers, I think um, Nova Scotia or somewhere in Canada, which are supposedly 300 million years old. So there's a big discrepancy there of 200 million years. And, th and then, then the other one is, um, I'm not sure if people have heard of the Ashley phosphate beds, but every time I, I bring it up uh, with an atheist, they seem to run away. And this is the reason why. They, they found a variety of fossils in a, in a bed layer, approximately 15 to 18 inches thick. Now, what they found was this. They found megatherium, which uh, lived between the early Pliocene through to the end of the Pleistocene, 1.8 to 3.25.3 to million years ago. They also found Hadrosaurus from the late Cretaceous, 65 to 145 million years. They found Iguanodron existed roughly mid-Jurassic around 170 million years ago. The plesiosaurs first appeared in the latest uh, Triassic period, possibly in the um, Ratian stage, about 203 million years ago. The Ichthyosaurs thrived during the uh, much of the Mesozoic era. Based on fossil evidence, they first appeared around 250 million years ago. Now, try and explain that range of fossils with those geological times in a layer 18 inches thick. Yeah, you cannot do it without a catastrophic uh, uh, flood. I noticed that Andrew has asked uh, about the favorite mineral. Uh, my favorite mineral is zinc sulfide, which is called sphalerite. In a future um, session, I will talk about zinc mines in Tennessee and how they argue for the worldwide flood. So, George, is your favorite mineral... A diamond is a girl's best friend. Is that your favorite mineral? <laughs> you've, you, you, you've read my mind. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let me yeah, uh, go to another volcanic issue and just make sure that uh, we're clear on this. Um, the evolutionary community claims that because creation science is based on the teaching of God's word, that everybody that's a flood geologist agrees on every point because it's in doctrine, but that's not true. The Bible provides a framework and the volcanic mountain, Mount St. Helens, I'm sorry, Mount St. Helens is an important topic for another time, but Mount Ararat forms an ex a beautiful example of how flood geologists don't agree about certain things. For example, Dr. Tim Clary has written uh, a number of things over the last 10 years we present the idea that because um, Mount Ararat is a volcanic uh, peak, the ark couldn't have landed there because the lava at 17, 16, 15,000 feet would not have sufficiently cooled and the boat would have caught on fire. Well, we know that 
they live, the animals live, the people live. My viewpoint on that is that the movement of the floodwaters as it receded from the mountain would be a tremendous heat sink. And all that uh, heat would have been pulled off, not a problem at all. Now, what's the objective, what's the objective uh, uh, evidence of this? Remember that uh, George and I both have talked about how the typical lava is called a basalt. It's an extrusive igneous rock, and it's got three basic kinds, called a pillow basalt, pohoi hoy, and then the crossword puzzle rock called ah uh, ah. Uh. Um, the pillow lavas can be observed to be formed as the Hawaiian volcanoes spill into the Pacific Ocean. So you can see these things and you can search for it online. Those pillow lavas, as you climb Mount Ararat, are found in the, in the outcrop as you move up to the higher elevations, 14, 15, 16,000. So it shows that it's a volcanic mountain. It shows that these rocks were cooled, certainly cooled by the time uh, the, uh, the floodwaters receded. And so Noah and his family and the animals could get out without burning their paws and feet on hot lava. Great response. Great uh information there, Professor McQueen. Um, I do have a couple more questions I could get to here, but uh, gentlemen, how would you like me to proceed? Do you want me to uh, grab another question out of this pile or? Well, I think that since we're at the 145 mark, let's take two more questions, George, and then I want to give a five minute summary and then you give a five minute summary and that should take us right to the two hour break. The two hour mark. Awesome. You guys have done a great job tonight. This has been, as I pointed out earlier, incredibly informative, and I'll definitely be re-watching it. So great research to the both of you. Stand, uh, standing, before we go to the questions, can I just share something with um, the audience? Uh, it's to do with limestone, because this, sure. is one of the, this is one of the objections that they bring forward with regards to the deposition of limestone, they actually say that uh, during a, um, a catastrophic event where you've got fast-moving water, you couldn't possibly get uh, deposition of limestone. I I'd like to share the screen and present a paper, secular paper, which dispels that. So I'll just do that now. Yeah, you want to share a screen? Sure. Yeah. Hey, can you see that? You're good, brother. Okay, this is a paper by Sheba et al. Uh, it's titled Experimental Deposition of Carbonate Mud from Moving Suspensions, Importance of Fluculations and Implications for Modern and, and Ancient uh, Carbonate Mud Deposition. Now, I've highlighted some, some of those uh, from that report. You can read it yourself. Y you can type that title and find it. And uh, this is what they say. The observations we report suggest that published interpretations of ancient lime muds are derived paleoceanographic conditions may need to be re-evaluated. And this is why they say that. They say there have been suggestions that just like a terrigenous muds, carbonate muds can flocculate and accumulate in high energy environments. Observations from modern carbonate environments and from the rock record suggest that deposition of carbonate muds by currents could have been common throughout geologic history. And they go on to say there have been occasional observations that carbonate muds may also accumulate in the presence of wave and current action. It is therefore right. quite possible that more carbonate muds will be interpreted as high energy deposits once the science behind the concept becomes established. This is something that we've talked about previously with David about how they discriminate against this kind of science because it, 
it just adds evidence to a flood situation. And, and it's no. unbelievable how, how they actually hinder, they actually hinder science by yeah. doing that. Now, George and I have talked about this in the last couple of months, but let's go over it again. We're talking about volcanoes putting out carbon dioxide. That's up there, CO2. And you can measure the amount of that in water by calling calling on a chemistry um, fact called partial pressure. CaCO3 is calcite. And George and I have mentioned on a number of occasions how temperature, pressure, in this case, the partial pressure of CO2, the pH, the EH, remember that's acidity, and the EH is the way electricity <coughs> moves around this uh, uh, compound, calcium carbonate. See, all of these factors here show that from the standpoint of ordinary high school chemistry, there's no reason that limestone couldn't precipitate quickly. And the paper that he just cited shows that traditional carbonate petrologists are coming over to the idea, wait, wait, we may even have turbulent water, and in that turbulent water, we can precipitate a limestone. Excellent point, George. Thank you. Yeah, uh, let's go into the questions now. Okay, here's a good question, uh, Professor McQueen. What are some of your personal favorite arguments for a worldwide flood? Okay, okay. Okay. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but let me clarify it uh, better now. If there were a worldwide flood, you would expect to find large formations of sandstone, shale, and limestone covering continents, not counties, covering large areas, not small areas. And so when you look at some of the rocks that we've talked about in the Grand Canyon, like the Coconino sandstone, for example, high in the canyon, it is found over an extensive area uh, in the um, uh, western United States. If you come to the Appalachian Mountains, follow them up to Nova Scotia that, uh, that George mentioned a few minutes ago, and then you take them across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe, uh, some of those Cambrian Ordovician units are uh, very similar to what you see here in America. I was on an archaeological dig as a geologist at the biblical AI. In Hebrew, it's the A is silent, so it's just I. But at any rate, when I walked out into the field where this uh, battle occurred, I looked down and saw the same kinds of dove gray limestones that I grew up around in East Tennessee. And so I turned to the archeologist, I said, this is an evidence of a worldwide flood. You find uh, large, extensive sedimentary deposits that are similar, shales, limestones, sandstones worldwide. So that's one of my favorite arguments. And the, and the monolithic nature of all those uh, sedimentary layers as well. And, of course, you've got the, your um, uh, bent uh, rock layers that show very little fracture. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, there, there are many. Oh, I'm sure we could go 10 hours and <laughs> still only just touch on the overwhelming evidence for a global flood. Um uh, Here's a comment for you, George, and then maybe we should hand it over to Professor McQueen for your five-minute summary since yes. we'll be coming up to the two-hour mark very, very shortly. Oh, yeah. Well, Al Alec, uh, I think I've spoken to Alec before. Or at least I've heard, I've heard him uh, in other live streams. Uh, potato scallops. Uh, down south, Alec, we call them potato cakes, and there's nothing better than an Aussie burger, mate. I don't know if you've tried... Um, a camel burger, but I have when I was in Central Australia. <laughs> oh, you're making me hungry here. Uh, uh, it's past my supper time. Looks good. <laughs> okay, let me uh, let me uh, summarize and reset my uh, my timer here so I can 
respect the five minute uh, mark there. Volcanic rocks are integral to the Great Flood. Uh, the volcanic rocks that we have uh, talked about, uh, basalt, rhyolite, the very light, frothy part of pumice and scoria, all of these uh, fit perfectly well into the time of the Great Flood. Were they present at creation? Were they present in the pre-flood world? It's purely speculation. But when you get up to Genesis 6, 7, and 8, where it talks about the breakup of the fountains of the great deep, that's always been basically two chemicals, water and lava, uh, and or compounds rather. And so certainly during the time of the flood, we can explain large uh, uh, bodies of uh, volcanic rock buried intermingled with sedimentary rocks. When we de when we moved to the post-flood time, there was a tremendous residual catastrophe leading all the way up to the time of Abraham, actually. So many of the very large lava flows, perhaps the Deccan uh, Plateau in India, uh, perhaps the lava flows in the UK and in Scandinavia might date from that time. They could be earlier. So when we look at uh, the evidence of uh, volcanic activity, we can explain a tremendous amount of CO2, and we can also, in the uh, modern times, look at the volume of CO2 that George has pointed out in our presentation tonight. And don't you realize that if every dog on Earth all the dogs that have lived since 1800 had access to a Chevrolet. And you see all these dogs driving around the world uh, since the automobile was invented. All the CO2 put out by all these dogs driving these Chevys, that is a minuscule part of the amount of carbon dioxide that could be put in the atmosphere. So if anything has changed our climate, it's geology, not dogs driving Chevrolets to try to make George laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. I love it. Uh, any final words from you, uh, Brother George? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go as far as to say um, it, it will be the secular scientists will, will, will actually disprove their, their own narrative. Because we've already seen with uh, CO2 and um, emitted from volcanoes and the experiments that have been done uh, by injecting it into volcanic um, uh, basaltic rock that it forms um, limestone. When they've been telling us for, you know, who knows, eons that limestone um, forms at a deposition rate of one to eight centimetres per thousand years. And then we show them that we can actually produce vast amounts of quantities of limestone in one year under the right conditions. Yes. And, we know, and we know those conditions were prevalent during that catastrophic event we call the global flood. And that's just one example. I mean, there's, there's many examples that uh, you can cite where um, I think I presented that paper where it's, it's suggested, you know, that moving water, even turbulent water, can actually deposit limestone, whereas before they were saying that was one of their arguments for against the flood, actually. They were saying that it, can't, it couldn't have happened because it would have been turbulent water and that limestone couldn't have deposited under those conditions. Yeah. Once again, and, they've been proven wrong. Yeah. And yeah. if you're in our Standing of Truth audience, whether in Australia or Canada or Europe, and have had basic chemistry, I hope you've seen that by taking just basic uh, chemical parameters like temperature, pressure, pH, EH, and other things that we've talked about, these are perfectly reasonable scientific explanations for the rapid deposition of calcium carbonate and the other carbonates that George mentioned tonight aragonite and dolomite and so forth. 
And so we want to leave you with a confidence tonight that we're not talking about something as complicated as nuclear physics here. We're talking about essentially uh, university freshman chemistry can help you uh, understand a lot of what's going on. Right, George? Uh, yes, uh, just w w I'd just like to address one of the questions um, in the private chat. Um, I'm not sure who it's from, but it says uh, it's it's regarding the argument focusing on valves. Do creationists have a difficult time explaining valves? No, we don't have a difficult time. I mean, valves are really just thin layers of s sediment deposits. And according to secular geology, they claim that those valves uh, are deposited uh, one per year. Now, they'll, they'll, cite, they'll cite a particular um, lake in Japan. I forget the name of it. But we've actually shown from uh, deposition of ash layers from volcanoes in that same lake through two, two different cores where the, var, the valve counts are different. So if they form one, at one, in, one per year, why are they different in the two cores? The other thing is um, Mount St. Helens. We saw what happened in Mount St. Helens. There's hundreds of feet, feet of valves were created in a matter of hours to days. <laughs> so, and for those, of you in, for those of you in the Stand for Truth audience that share my interest in World War II history, recall that in Greenland, a World War II bomber <laughs> oh, yeah. was oh, found yeah. deep in the ice. And if you could go down on a chair, you would see tremendous varves show up, you know, in the layers of ice. And yet we know that this bomber had to end up in the in the ice in the 1940s. So it's it's less than 100 years old. So no matter mm -hmm. how you cut it, uh, talking about a lake like uh, uh, George was talking about or World War II history, uh, varves don't necessarily mean even annual layers. It's more complicated than that. Yeah, the, and the, I, I want to say this, George, um, real quick, uh, because comments are, are coming in, flying by, and uh, everybody is is really appreciative of, of all the work that's being done on Standing for Truth, all the work that, that you brothers are doing, Professor McQueen and George. Uh, this was a great stream. So I just wanted to thank uh, all our viewers for the kind words, for the support. You guys really are the life and blood of this channel. There's a question here from Crimson Air. Uh, good to see you. Crimson Air says, does Professor McQueen have a YouTube channel? I want to point out that uh, Professor McQueen has been on here weekly, pretty well every every Wednesday almost for months. And I've put together a playlist that you can find if you just go to the playlist section. It's titled Professor McQueen slash, I believe, The Global Flood. There's about 17 videos, all of Professor McQueen's. Um, and so... Through the kindness of Standing for Truth in Canada, uh, Standing for Truth has become my YouTube channel. I don't need to make another one. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's it, it's an honor, Professor McQueen. I was saying that in the chat. Uh, this pretty well is your YouTube channel. So you've been an incredible blessing. And I was saying earlier that that series of all your presentations that you've done for us so far is probably one of the most thorough and detailed and informative series on the uh, global flood that you can find, especially on YouTube. So uh, I want well, people to check kind that of out. You, I'll, uh, I will get ready to sign off by uh, thanking my uh, friend George for all his support on this and thanking you, uh, Standing for Truth. Uh, if the ice and snow doesn't bury me and freeze me this next week here in Louisiana. <coughs> Maybe we can continue this discussion all the way through Christmas. Hey, Good night, yo. gentlemen. Good night. God all bless. Right. Great show. We just hit the two hour and one minute mark. So everybody, we will see you back here in a couple days. We've got a debate and next week's going to be a busy week as well with some shows and uh, in the next couple hours, you'll see the next video in our Dinosaur and Man series on Patreon should be available. And also uh, Matt and myself, Matt Man, 
we have been going through some some videos and articles coming out from the evolutionists, the critics. So pretty soon we're going to do another show live with SFT and, and Matt Man, where we are going to go through uh, either an article. There's a couple articles we want to debunk mm. as well as a ton of videos, videos that'll keep us busy for the next million years. So we're just kind of narrowing it down and, and we're going to pick one and that should be within a few days as well. So uh, stay tuned guys, George, great job tonight. Great research. You're the man brother. Uh, I'm going to give it to you for some final words. Uh, I'm still waiting for that award. <laughs> <laughs> it must've got lost in the mail. I mean, I sent it to you six months ago after your first show. <laughs> Uh, that must be the reason. I knew that's there was gotta something. be the reason. That's the reason, and I'm sticking yeah. to it, brother. Yeah, go anyway, ahead. Anyway, totally enjoyed it. Actually, it um, when, when I get these kind of subjects, I, I just get motivated to do some research, and I find stuff that I just didn't know, like the uh, you know up to ten million submarine volcanoes. That's that's amazing. It's amazing. Hey. It's amazing. Great job. You did a phenomenal job. Uh, share this on Facebook. Uh, share this around everybody in the audience. Thanks again for the super stickers, super chats, and amazing support. Anyways, SFT and George uh, are out. Out. <laughs>